والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله على عما بعد to brothers and sisters in Islam, respected guests, elders, I welcome you all the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the, Islam, the, Queen, the Queen Mary Islamic Society is honored to have two guests today held in such high regard in their respected areas. I'm sure many of you have come to our launch. And this is the launch of our uh, Islamic Awareness Week. This is the first event. And the event is entitled, is entitled Islam or Atheism, which is more rational. On my right, I have Dr. Brendan Lover. Uh, he's a lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire. He studied philosophy and mathematics at the University of Oxford at Bayer College and graduated with a Master's in Philosophy at Queen's University, Ontario. He taught in the University of Liverpool and Oxford before moving to Hertfordshire in 1997. His specialities lie in history and in the history and philosophy of mathematics and science. He's contributed to many books, including publications such as uh, Moral Particularism and Scientific Practice, Between Logic and History, and Mill on Liberty, Thoughts and Discussion. It's just to name a few. He's had many more uh, scholarly articles as well. Um, and probably most significantly, because in terms of debate, um, he's a member of the Humanist uh, Philosophy, uh, Humanist Association of Philosophy, and he's also upon and in the committee. Now, on my left, I have Hamza. Just before I met him, he said he's adamant that he doesn't want to get introduced. So we just introduce him as Hamza. That's Hamza. As I said, the topic of the debate today is Islam or atheism, which is more rational. Now, in the West, philosophers such as Bertrand Russell, A.J. Ayer, and Karl Marx have um, are the illustration of how atheism has had a seismic shift in terms of sport has become more significant towards atheism, but and towards atheism as well as religion becoming. Uh, kind of secular within countries, as in religion is no longer a part of many people's mind. But when you flip the coin and you look at Islam, something strange happens because since 9 11, the focus has shifted primarily on Islam. And I don't know if you noticed, but last, it was 2nd January, BBC they released an article, they published an article even, in which they said that in 2010, more people are converting to Islam since 9 11. It seems quite strange because you think, and obviously the media portrays Islam in some sort of negative way, that Islam would be somewhat, you know, not in people's mind and have a negative approach. Yet yeah, Islam is increasing, and this is the main this is the main puzzle of the debate. Because in the last hundred or so years, both Islam and atheism are increasing in support. But of course, only one can be correct, and indeed this is the job of the uh, speakers here to debate and uh, argue the point in which is more. Uh, <coughs> which is more rational, Islam or atheism. But before I invite Hamza to be speaking first, before I invite him to um, deliver, deliver his opening speech, I'd like to go over a few areas of protocol in that um, how the debate will be set out. Both speakers will get 25 minutes opening time, opening time for their speeches. Subsequently after that, there will be 10 minutes of rebuttal time. After the rebuttal, we'll open the debate to the floor. There will be mics provided in later on. And after the first minute question and answer session, we finish up with five minutes, um, uh, with five minutes closing speeches, and uh, the guests will stick around afterwards. If you have any questions, you can ask them then. So, without further ado, I'd like to call Hamza to give his opening speech. So I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God. In Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Back. Brothers and sisters and friends, I greet you the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Which essentially means, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Before I formally get into my presentation, I'd like to add that there are some dramatic events happening in Egypt at the moment. Over 100,000 people in Alexandria alone have taken to the streets to revolt against a well-known brutal dictator. The police have given up and the army is now entering the cities. Whether you're religious, irreligious, you believe in a God or not, I think we can all come together in some form and really wish the Egyptians well. And from my personal perspective, I pray to Allah, I pray to God, that the Egyptians are liberated from the brutal, tyrannical dictator. 
You may think this has nothing to do with today's debate, but I think it has a lot to do with today's debate. Because I believe if you implement an irreligious ideology, a non-religious ideology, upon a people who have a heritage that's religious, and you enforce it down their necks, you're going to get oppression, and subsequently, you're going to get this revolt. So today's topic is about Islam or atheism, which one is more rational? I would argue today that if we use rational thinking, we will come to the conclusion that atheism is irrational and that Islam is the rational position to take with regards to man, life and the entire universe. And this resonates in the Time magazine article that was published in 1980. It had a major story entitled Modernizing the Case for God and it said God is making a comeback. Most intriguingly this is happening not among theologians or ordinary believers, but in the crisp intellectual circles of academic philosophers where the consensus had long banished the Almighty from fruitful discourse. Now to argue that Islam is the most rational position to take, I will use the following arguments. One, the existence of God. Two, the miraculous nature of the Quran which is the holy book of the Muslims. The reason I am going to use these arguments is because these are the core intellectual foundations of the Islamic worldview. And if you were to break these foundations, Islam would fall. Now I'm not going to talk much about atheism because I would leave that for the doctor to bring into his presentation and I would respond as and when required. But before I get into my arguments, we have to discuss what do we mean by rational. Now I could go into a complex philosophical debate about empiricism and rationalism and a priori and a posteriori and all these types of philosophical terms. But because I don't want to bore you to death, I will give you an interesting example. Imagine we're all sitting at home. Student halls, mommy's house, daddy's house, our penthouse, wherever we may be. And at 12 o'clock at night, midnight, someone knocks on the door. And we go, we're a bit scared, we look through the spyglass, and we see a man in his red underpants. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, a naked man just with red underpants. And he says, assuming I'm a lady, Are you right, love? I want to check your gas meter. What would a rational person do? <coughs> would you let the man in the red underpants in? Or would you keep him out? Well, I think the majority of us will keep him out because we would use our rational thinking, which includes previous experience, previous information. It includes logic. It includes the rational method of thinking. Because we know, we know that a gas man doesn't wear red underpants and he doesn't come at midnight. So this is a very good example for us to, crudely if you like, but it resonates what the rational method of thinking is. And if we apply this type of thinking on the Islamic worldview and the intellectual foundations of the Islamic worldview, we will come to the conclusion, I believe, if we're sincere, that Islam has a very positive, cogent case for its intellectual foundations. So let's first start with God's existence. Now brothers, sisters and friends, we have obviously all asked the same questions. Why does something exist? Where did the universe come from? Where did I come from? Where am I going? In this slide, the Quran, the book of the Muslims, also states, or do they think the universe came out of nothing? It's a very important question that we need to answer. Otherwise, we will be wandering in the dark. Now, how do we respond to this universal perennial question? Now, 
Many atheists, such as Bertrand Russell, they claim that the universe is just there, and that's all. But is that a useful conclusion? Is that a positive answer? Does it take us anywhere? Well, actually, that answer itself leads to huge problems. Because if the universe is just there and that's all, that would mean that the past of the universe is infinite. It would mean that the history of the universe is infinite. In other words, the universe has an infinite history of past events. But we know this doesn't make any sense. It creates paradoxes. It baffles us. And let me explain this with some examples. The infinity doesn't make sense. And let me show you why. Imagine we have an infinite number of Richard Dawkins in this room. Everyone know who Richard Dawkins is? Yeah. Good. He's the prophet of neo-atheism. Did you get the pun? I'm going to get better as we go along, I assure you. So... If there's an infinite number of Richard Dawkins in this room, and I take away five Richard Dawkins, how many do we have left? Some people say infinity, the logicians amongst us say infinity minus five. Whatever answer we give, we should practically be able to count how many Richard Dawkins are in the room. But we can't. Let me give you another example. Say we have a hundred Richard Dawkins in this room. At every possible moment, I add another Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins 101, Richard Dawkins 1001, Richard Dawkins a million and one, and we continue. Am I ever going to reach an amount which we can describe as an infinite amount of Richard Dawkins? Why? Because someone may just say, just add another one. So from these examples, we understand that the infinity as a concept cannot be exported into the real world. It doesn't make sense in the real world. Mathematically it makes sense because it's based on certain axioms and conventions in the mathematical realm of discourse, of discussion. But there is no ontological export into the real world, meaning we can't export the idea into the real world. In this slide, mathematicians, Kasman and Newman, they said the infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense that we say there are fish in the sea. Also, the, the famous German mathematician, David Hilbert, he said the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature, nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. But if we go back to the universe, we know that past events are real. Therefore, the number of past events in the universe cannot be infinite. And by rational necessity, there must be finite. So the series of events in the universe cannot go back forever, so it logically follows that the universe must have began to exist. And the beginning of the universe is also supported by astrophysical evidence. For example, has everyone heard of the Big Bang? Good. And I assure you it's not a thing that happens after too many curries. <laughs> Now the Big Bang, also called the Hot Standard Model, talks about that physical time and space were created and matter and energy were also created at a point which cosmologists described as the singularity. As the scientist PCW Davies comments, for this reason, most cosmologists think of the initial singularity as the beginning of the universe. Also, John Boswell, the author of Stephen Hawking's Universe, states, the biggest misunderstanding about the Big Bang is that it began as a lump of matter somewhere in the void of space. It was, just, it was not just matter that was created during the Big Bang. It was space and time that was created. So in a sense, time has a beginning and space also has a beginning. Now, if we take this into consideration, then the Big Bang would imply that the universe was created out of nothing. But there's a problem here. Because out of nothing, nothing comes. This is why 
P.J. Zwart, in his publication about time, says, if there is anything we find inconceivable, it is that something could arise from nothing. Now we can summarize this argument in the following way. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, and it logically follows, the universe has a cause. But all we know from this argument, brothers, sisters and friends, is that the universe has a cause. It doesn't mean it's God. It doesn't mean it's the Divine. It doesn't mean it's Buddha, or Jesus, or any of the 6,000 names we've attributed to this cause since 6,000 BC Sumeria. We've been confused. However, if we stick to the rational method of thinking, using conceptual analysis, which in essence means thinking hard about something, we will come to the conclusion that this cause is the divine and is in line with the Islamic conception of God, also known as Allah. Now, upon conceptual analysis, this cause must be one. Because if we use the philosophical principle of Occam's razor, which states not to multiply entities beyond necessity, then we can conclude that the best and simplest explanation is that this cause must be one. Also, this cause must be uncaused. Because if you read a lot of Richard Dawkins' work, or some atheists, one of the outdated philosophical cliches, in my opinion, is that, well, who created God? We hear that all the time. And they think it's a baseball bat against the theists. But it's made of sponge. And let me tell you why. Because we already have understood the absurdity of an infinite regress. Let me bring this to you in a popular sense. If we say, what caused the cause that caused the universe, then let's continue. What caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Let's continue. Then what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Let's carry on. Then what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused... Any more be rapping? <laughs> I know I'm from Hackney, but I'm very bad at rapping. <laughs> you know? Move to the group to get your live lead, jump on the mic and start to MC. <laughs> <laughs> also, imagine I'm a Marine. I'm a Marine. And I want to shoot my friend Mohammed, who's filming me at the moment, right? In order for me to shoot, I have to ask permission from the Marine behind me. Can I shoot Mohammed? I have to ask permission too, dude. Can I sh get permission to give permission to Hamza to shoot Mohammed? I have to ask permission too, dude. And if that goes on forever, if that goes on forever, will I ever shoot Mohammed? <coughs> exactly. So in essence, to claim who created God and what caused the cause of the universe is equivalent of saying that we don't have a universe. Also, upon conceptual analysis, this cause must be immaterial and transcendent. Because since this cause created space and time, it therefore must transcend space and time. In other words, it must be atemporally and non-spatially existent. And the logical conclusion is that this cause must be immaterial as material things exist within space and time. Significantly, brothers, sisters and friends, this cause must have a will. It must be able to connect with people, with willful agents, in other words, with human beings. It must be able to have a relationship. And why am I attributing a will to this cause? This cause has a will, because if it's eternal, due to it being uncaused, and it created a finite effect called the universe, therefore, it must have chosen for it to come into existence, and choice indicates a will, and a will indicates that it can have a relationship with the universe. So we can conclude, brothers, sisters and friends, that not only a cause for the universe exists, 
but a core that has divine attributes in accordance with the Islamic conception of God. As God says in the Quran in the 112th chapter, say, He is God, the one and only, the eternal, the absolute. He begets not, nor was He begotten, and there is nothing like unto Him. He is immaterial and transcendent. Exactly what we've come to when we use our rational thinking. Now with regard to the second aspect of my presentation, I'm going to discuss the miracle of the Qur'an. Before we do this, we have to discuss, are miracles coherent? Well, the old definition of a miracle are things that transcend or break natural law. But I think that's an incoherent definition of what a miracle is. Because natural laws, brothers, sisters and friends, are just inductive generalizations of patterns that we perceive in the universe. And if something changes from that pattern, it doesn't mean it's a miracle. Maybe we haven't been looking hard enough, or waiting long enough, or our induction is wrong. So it makes a miracle incoherent from this definition. However, if we define miracles as acts of impossibilities, they become more coherent. In other words, if we say a miracle is an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature, then we are able to continue with the philosophy of miracles. Why am I saying this? Because if we exhaust all the logically possible naturalistic explanations, then it's a signpost to the supernatural. And the Qur'an is exactly this, for three main reasons. I'm going to briefly touch upon it, and I want us to have a frank discussion in the question and answers. The first reason is that it has a linguistic and literary miracle. The Qur'an's use of Arabic has de-scoped the Arabic language. Not with regards to the effect of his eloquence, like Shakespeare, to be or not to be, O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo, deny thy father, deny thy name, I'm moved. <laughs> Although it did transcend eloquence at that time, but significantly, it created a new literary form of the Arabic language. Prose, poetry, and then you have Qur'an. And this is why Foster Fitzgerald Arbuthnot, who was a notable British Orientalist and translator, he states and that though several attempts have been made to produce a work equal to it, as far as elegant writing is concerned, none has yet succeeded. succeeded. No one can match the literary form of the Arabic language in the Qur'an. As Professor Bruce Lawrence aptly says in his book, The Qur'an and Biography, as tangible signs, Qur'anic verses are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, layered within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. So the unique literary form of the Qur'an, as I said, is not based on subjective criteria, Rather, it's based on observable features, which makes it objective. And therefore, we can say that the Qur'an is a literary and linguistic miracle, because when we go to the nature of the event, which is the Arabic language, and we exhaust all possibilities of the Arabic language with regards to the 28 letters and the finite grammatical rules, we can't create the Qur'anic literary form. So it's a signpost to the transcendent. Another aspect of the Qur'anic miracle is a historical aspect. The historical information was impossible, logically impossible, to have been known at that time. For instance, the description for the leader of the Egyptians. We know in the religious texts, he was referred to the Pharaoh, in Arabic, Firaun. But in the Quran, it has two distinctions, the Pharaoh and the king. Why does it make these two distinctions? Where well, makes the distinction of Pharaoh at the time of Moses, Musa alayhi salam. And he makes the distinction of king at the time of Yusuf, Joseph alayhi salam. And we know, if we go to the historical works such as the Britannic, Britannic Encyclopedia, we find that it was at these periods that these descriptions were used. But in order for the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to have known this, he must have had access to hieroglyphic works. They didn't exist. The Rosetta Stone came much, much after. So, we can argue 
In light of this, how could have the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, known such a minute historical detail? Especially when all the other religious texts and historical texts at that time didn't mention this. A lot of the Christian missionaries and orientalists claim he copied from the Bible and the Torah. That's very interesting. He must have read it, copied it, and corrected it. If that was the case, he would have had a library of Alexandrian magnitude. He couldn't read. The next and final miraculous aspect of the Qur'an is what I call natural phenomena or the scientific miracle. Now there's many in the Qur'an, but I want to mention one that's quite specific about mountains. The Qur'an in two different places talks about mountains in the following way. We have placed firmly embedded mountains on the earth so we would not move under them. In another place, have we not made the earth as a bed and the mountains as its pegs? Now this is quite interesting because according to geologists, only in the late stages of the 20th century we have found that mountains have peg-like structures. They have root-like structures, which are 10 to 15 times the size of the mountain above the earth. And its function is to ensure that the earth is stabilized, to prevent excessive shocks. We know we have earthquakes, but to prevent from more earthquakes of happening, something which the Quran mentions. Now if we refer to the book Earth by Dr. Frank Press, he mentions that mountains are like stakes and are very deep under the surface of the earth. And with regards to the function of these pegs or stakes, it is called isostasis in geology, and you can find this in M.J. Selby's book, Earth Changing Surface. So how do we explain this in light of the fact that it's relatively recent science, with no one at the time of revelation knowing this information? The science at the time was so primitive, they thought the only function of mountains was to keep the sky up. And that was the reality. So, when we look at all these aspects of the Quranic miracle, we see that when we go to the logical, the logical possible explanation from a naturalistic perspective, and we are exhaust all possible explanations and we can't find an answer, there is a signpost to the supernatural. So, I have concluded that it's more rational to believe the Islamic worldview because we have good reasons to believe in the existence of God and good re reasons to believe in His revelation called the Qur'an. I want to spend just one minute just also talking about the absurdity of life without religion, without God, without Islam. Without God, life has no meaning, true meaning. Because if our ends are the same, if we pass out of existence, what meaning does that give to our lives? Does it matter even if we existed at all? Arthur, Sch Arthur Schopenhauer, he said he wished the world would never exist and he wrote an essay on suicide. Is there any ultimate value if our lives really end in the grave, we become worms meat? Does it matter if you live as a saint or as a devil? Think about this. Does it matter if you were a scientist spending your whole life to find the cure for cancer? Or the politician striving for world peace? Aren't we just going to die and that's it? What about objective moral values? Without God there are no objective moral values. Believing in something is truly bad or good and it transcends human subjectivity. Because God is the only conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity. And in absence of God, you just have evolution and social pressure which are ever-changing, therefore it renders morality subjective and relative. So there's no true objective meaning, something we could discuss later. But the late atheist professor J. O. Mackey, he said in his book Ethics, there are no objective values. And finally, brothers, sisters and friends, according to the atheist worldview, life is purposeless. For at best, it is for us to assemble and propagate our DNA. Who's a scientist here? Put your hand up. Well, if our purpose, according to the scientific worldview, is to propagate our DNA, then you should never claim that Islamic ethics are immoral when we say we can have four wives. Because <laughs> we're propagating DNA. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that the atheist would say 
that for no purpose you create purpose for yourself, but that's a self-delusion, because we try to find some purpose, but the underlying purpose of our life is non-existent. It is no wonder, brothers, sisters and friends, that the Qur'an says, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger to that which gives you life. Because if you respond to the atheist call, do we really have a life, or is it just self-delusion? Thank you very much for listening. Society for inviting me. They have been absolute models of, uh, of welcomingness. What's the word I want? Hospitality. That's it. Absolutely marvellous so far. Um, events in Egypt, yes, we should be interested in the things going on about us. Um, but let's not commit to the fallacy of guilt by association. Um, <laughs> There are atheists and atheists, you know. And if you impose anything on a population that has grown up committed to something else, you will find opposition, and rightly so. Right? Um, this is much I want to say about that. Also, there is no such thing as the atheist worldview. Atheists are like Muslims. We have no hope. Right? There isn't. There isn't an atheist that sits around deciding what is the atheist worldview. In particular, the thought that, uh, well, the purpose of life according to atheists is to propagate your DNA. Well, there may be some atheists who think that. Um, I'm not one of them, um, so you'll have to find another argument to embarrass me. Uh, Rational. I wasn't tremendously happy with the word rational because if you're if you're irrational or less than rational, they can put you away. Um, and I'd like to think that and people can disagree about these kinds of things, you know, religion and so on, without suggesting that there's some kind of serious mental infirmity in people they disagree with. I like the word reasonableness better, but it doesn't really matter, right? But get you know, a sense of what's at stake. Um, method, yeah, I'm all in favour of the uh, logical method and logical analysis. Um, but I noticed an awful lot of quotes, a lot of quotations in um, Hamza's very learned presentation. Well, anyone who's practised at reading Holy Scripture knows that you can always find a verse, whatever your holy book is, whether it's the Quran, the Torah. Christian Gospels, Book of Mormon, the, um, the, the, the Book of the Sikhs, whatever it is, you want to go to war, there'll be a verse you can find, right? You want to make peace, there'll be a verse you can find, because any holy book that is uh, going to be the basis of any society has to be sufficiently rich that it has its warlike moments and its peaceful moments and its family moments and its artistic moments and its like It's all got to be in there, right? So if you are a, uh, a skilled practitioner of any religion that's based in a book, you have to get good at finding a verse that uh, supports what you want to say. But once you get good at doing it, you know, so what you do is, you say what you want to do, you explain why you want to do it, and you say, and does a good book not say? And then you say what well, your verse, that you write. I mean, um, any competent preacher will, will know how to do that. But once you've got the hang of that with um, the Holy Book, well, then you go to the entire corpus of everything that's ever been written by any academic anywhere, and you find that whatever you want to say, there will be somebody who has <laughs> said something of the sort, right? There'll be a professor of something somewhere who says something like what you are hoping to, to put out. Um, so I don't have that many. I don't have that many quotations. Um, and of course, whether a position—it's not really positions that are rational or irrational. It's our reasons for holding them. So there can be perfectly irrational reasons for being an atheist. 
right? So if somebody said, I'm an atheist because my father was an atheist and he was an atheist before him, right? I come from atheist stock. That would be a terrible reason for being an atheist. Or if you said, um, it's my culture. I was, you know, my, we, we come from, I raised an atheist culture, part of who I am, my cultural identity to be an atheist. That would be a pretty dreadful reason for being an atheist. Because right? isn't it supposed to be about what's true? Right? Or if somebody said, well, I need atheist luminaries to tell me what, uh, what I, how I should live my life, right? How, what my morals ought to be. If you think that you, know, that you only get morals if the universe is a certain way, then wishing to have morals and therefore wishing that the universe is that way won't do, right? So if somebody said, well, look, I just wouldn't know how to live my life if I didn't have Polly Toynbee to tell me, and that's why I'm an atheist. This too would be a pretty dreadful reason for being an atheist. I want to say a few words about um, my understanding of religion, what I think religion is. Um, essentially, I think religion is culture that imagines itself to be something else. Right? I think the religion is culture that sometimes imagines itself to be science. It's, religion, it's culture that sometimes imagines itself to be metaphysics. It's culture that sometimes imagines itself to be politics. Well, as culture, religion is valuable. Right? I mean, I'm a native speaker of English, and anyone who cares about the English language has to care about uh, historical translations of the Bible and the King James authorised version in particular. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, um, what have we got? Just from the Sermon on the Mount, you've got salt of the earth, wolf in sheep's clothing, hiding a light under a bushel, going the extra mile, the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, and throwing pearls before swine. That's just a small collection of the contributions to the to English language culture that come from um, the Bible as we receive it. We would be poorer without that body of culture, and as culture, I don't repudiate it. In fact, I rather regret that people don't read the Bible as much as they used to. Why? Because at least in the more historic translations, it's got some lovely language in it, right? Okay. Um, what to do first? Let's, let's do the, uh, the negative part first. Um, cosmological argument. Well, I think the cosmological argument is really a game with words. Right? Because we don't know what it means for a divine being to create a universe. You could use, right, here's, here's, here's some causation, right? Yeah. Bit of gravity, yeah? Actually, there are two bits of causation in one side, and I decided to let it go, and we have some information about how that works, although we haven't solved it yet, right? Quite how decisions lead to um, physical movements, I can tell you from the very frontiers of philosophy, we don't know, right? Um, and you've got some gravity as well, so that. Uh, if you look about what were the causes of the First World War, what were the causes of the banking crisis, these are intelligible questions, right? Because these are kinds of causality we understand. If you say, um, I'm going to tell you what caused the universe, it was a divinity deciding that let there be uh, a world, we have no idea what that means. What the word, what the word cause means in that context it's, it's fallen to the level of just being a noise. All right, we have to hear it in a noun, but we don't know much more than that. Um, so that's, you know, I imagine we might return to this, but that's essentially what I think about um, the cosmological world. I do want to say a few words about the because uh, I can't resist it. Uh, mathematics essentially... Um, it comes in two flavours. There's mathematics of things you can count, right? Uh, it's called discrete mathematics. And the mathematics of stuff you can measure. 
Now, the examples that were supposed to confuse you about infinity were all drawn from discrete mathematics. They're all cases of here's one, here's another one, here's one, here's another one. So, in the case of the Marines, that's the question to shoot into a discrete case. Right? But events, well, how big is an event? Well, okay, maybe, the, maybe the, an event is five minutes long. Well, what caused the second half of the event? Well, I was going to read the two and a half minute event. I should have started with it. Anyway, let's make it eight minutes long, right? Just keep the sums easy. So what caused the second half of the event? The event? Well, it was the first half. That's one minute there. What caused you know, the second half of that? Right, and you can go on dividing ad infinitum. I uh, mentioned... Um, David Hilbert's, uh, I think it was 1926 lecture on the infinite. Um, it generally comes up. I first heard it mentioned in a lecture by, very much like the one we just heard, by William Lane Craig. I heard it in 1990, I think. Um, this, this thought that you don't find infinities in nature. And Hilbert was relying on um, two thoughts. One of them is that we now have elliptical geometries. Because there used to be an argument that... Um, the universe had to be infinite in space and time because what happens when you get to the end, right? Where's the end, right? But Hilbert says, and, and Hilbert, by the way, he gets always introduced as the great mathematician David Hilbert, but he wasn't doing great mathematics at this point. All he was doing was reporting, you know, what would have been, what would have been the scientific news. If Hilbert's focus as a mathematician is part of the argument, I'd like to know from an expert on this whether the things that he says in the rest of that article, where he tries to do something with the, um, with the continuum hypothesis, whether the argument that he makes in the second half of that article is part of the mathematical work that contributes to his greatness, or whether it's simply, you know, uh, later work that isn't part of his real monuments. Okay. Uh, so I'm not impressed by the cosmological argument. I am not intimidated by uh, infinite regresses. Uh, in any case, I think it's just a word game. Right? We had all this, you know, you watch these debates, and what happens is there'll be some people will come in and be blinded by science, right? There'll be lots of talk about. Um, by the way, whether or not Hilbert is right depends on whether space time is quantized, and they still don't know. Right? If space-time is quantized, then Hilbert is right. Yeah? But if space-time is continuous, well, then you have an infinity in nature. We don't know yet. Now, put your hand up. Please put your hand up if you are waiting, if, you're, if you are holding your religious convictions in suspense, to wait to find out the latest news from the field of quantum loop geometry. No. Right? Of course not. All this stuff about the origin of the universe and, you know, what's, what causes, what caused the Big Bang, all that stuff, it's off the point. I don't, I'm amazed if there's anybody who's, who waits to settle their religious convictions, waits to find out, you know, what news from cosmologists, whether we have to believe in a Big Bang or whether there is a narrow neck and a big, you know, whether the universe kind of contracts and expands and contracts and expands. We've got all these models, and there's usually somebody in the audience who studies this stuff and makes a speech about it, and it's irrelevant. I really think so. Okay. How many for time? Okay, thanks. Now, the Quran. Um, I must confess some nervousness here because I know how. Uh, how dear this is revered by Muslims. I, you know, having been invited here, um, I don't wish to be rude about it. However, I also have an obligation of... I'm not going to be very rude, by the way. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be gratuitously rude. I promise you that. I promise you that. I'm not going to be gratuitously rude. I do have an obligation to be straight with you. Now, I can only read it in English. And it does strike me as a rather odd feature. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not in a position 
to judge um, whether it really is a linguistic miracle. I have to say, um, I can't throw off a suspicion. Let me put it this way. I never met a Jewish person yet who was anything less than enthusiastic about bagels. 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 Yeah. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about people who self-consciously self-identify as Jewish and make that part of their identity. Right? One of the things, one of the ways you mark that is by insisting that bagels are really nice. Now you would think, this being a question of um, taste, you would think that there would be a few people who would say, well, actually, I prefer that kind of rich, nutty brown bread that they make in rural France. No. There is perfect unanimity on the bagel question. Why? Because it's not really about food. Right? It's not really about taste. Yeah? It's about who you are. And uh, for this reason, where you have perfect unanimity in an interest group, you do have to wonder quite what's going on and whether that unanimity is achieved by some straightforward judgment. Now, as I say, I read the Quran in English, and some things struck me about it. Um, the main thing that strikes me about it is the, what shall we say, the fragility of the divine communication strategy. Right? There is a message for all mankind. Very important message that everybody has to hear. Supposing you had a very important message for every human being on the planet, what do you do? Do you whisper it once to one person in one place at one time and then rely on him and his friends to put the word out? That is not how messages are spread, right? Now, the authority of this text, the reason, apparently, the reason why I should believe this text and treat it, you know, as a revelation rather than as an interesting old book, I have a thing for interesting old books. It's rather my professional area, right? I mean, I, you know, that's why I read it. Um, the reason I should treat it as a revelation is because it has these miraculous properties. And in particular, that it's a, um, a linguistic miracle. By the way, I'm, I can't say I'm impressed by the, the other stuff, because there may have been roots for the you know, information about ancient Egypt to reach, which are now no longer um, available to scholarship, right? Um, not everything gets preserved. In fact, the thing about history is, almost nothing gets preserved. Um, but the real point is that uh, the authority of this text relies on a property that it has, which is only evident to native speakers of Arabic. Right. Now this seems to me to be a rather short-sighted feature. If the author of the universe wanted to show his word to me, um, wouldn't he do it in a way that would be, you know, evident to me. Why has he delivered a miracle to native speakers of Arabic, but not the rest of us? This seems rather odd. There are also some strange omissions. Because there, there are all those, all, there's all that debating practice, yeah? The unbelievers will say this, you should say so and so, right? I have to say, you put those passages next to Plato and Aristotle, it's embarrassing. But the really odd thing about all that information about how to spread the word is it doesn't include some crucial information which you would think that the author of the universe, the master of the world, would be able to impart. For example, you would think he would say, build ships. Build large ocean-going ships and sail west. Past Gibraltar, yeah, keep going, you will find two lush continents thinly populated by Stone Age cultures which you will easily subdue, and from there you can dominate the world. This would have been useful information for anyone wishing to build a world religion. 
right? What is the divine communications plan for taking the word of Islam to the Aborigines of Australia? And how's it going? Was it part of the divine communication strategy that North America, South America, Australia, and uh, Polynesia should be conquered and colonized by Christians? Right? This, it may be a very slow burn. Right? They're met that, you know, we're told that the Lord moves in mysterious ways, he's wanted us to perform. But, uh, uh, you know, not mentioning at a crucial moment when the information could have been useful that, you know, the world has this geography, uh, that, I think, might have been more use than interesting but not tremendously practical geological information about the undersides of mountains. Okay. Um, reasons why, not just, um, what have I got? Five minutes, okay. Reasons why I am not myself religious. Well, we are all atheists about almost all gods, right? Yeah? I mean, most people, nobody now believes in Thor and Zeus and Tuteus and uh, Anubis and all the rest of them. Most people here, I think, probably believe in just the one at most, right? So we all reject the great majority of world religions past and present. Now, you have to ask yourself, you have to explain the existence of all those other religions. And the best explanation is that those other religions respond to psychological, sociological, historical needs of the moment. Right? I mean, this, this is easiest to see in the most recent cases. So if you look at the um, Church of Latter-day Saints, right, the so-called Mormons, I mean, the Book of Mormon, um, it's, it's interesting reading. It, it really reads like, um, here is somebody so impressed by the uh, King James Bible that he thought he wrote his own. So. <laughs> uh, but if he goes on being cute, I'm going to stop because I can't... <laughs> Um, <laughs> where was I? Oh yes. Um, it must have seemed very strange as as the new society, the new country that was in the USA, was coming to self consciousness and stepping into you know what felt like its historical destiny. It must have seemed very strange that um, that when when God walked on earth as man, he didn't walk in God's own earth, right? So, there was a felt need for a specifically American form of Christianity, and one up here. Right? Religions grow, religions emerge in response to particular social, ethical, <coughs> spiritual needs. Right? That is the explanation that we all have to make for all the religions that we don't subscribe to. And then the neatest thing to do and the thing that causes you least embarrassment is simply to say, rather than this rather, you know, this rather awkward position where the explanation for my religion is that it's true, but the explanation for the existence of all other religions is that they respond to psychological and social and spiritual needs, no. why not go for the simple, simple explanation that religion as a whole is culture and it develops as culture, it develops in the way that culture does, it is a thing that human beings produce, right? And something that we, in its, you know, in its better phases, when it's producing poetry, when it's reminding us to be decent to each other, there's absolutely no, no reason why we should repudiate it, or be ashamed of it, or fight over it. Um... Ethics, yeah. Um, a lot of this stuff is about authority. Right? And there is something that um, many atheists have in common, which is the view that the authority on the meaning of your life 
is you. And that you diminish yourself if you uh, parcel that task out, parcel the job of working out what your life is about, to somebody else. And if you give it over to some institution or some, uh, some tradition. Because you can't escape your responsibility for figuring out who you are and what your life is about. Right? Even if you subscribe to a religious tradition, you will find that there are countercurrents within that tradition, and again, you have to decide where to position yourself within your religion. Right? There's no escape from the responsibility of deciding who you are and what you're about. Ethics, well, this is a, a big story, I've only got one minute. But I'll say this. Um, the idea that you need an anchor or an, on, or an ontological basis for ethics is just a bit of philosophical noise to scare you, right? You're supposed to think, oh, I have been all my life, I've been treating people like people because I have inescapable insight into what it's like to be them, right? But suddenly, I'm told that my ethics needs something called an ontological basis. Where do I get one of those? Which shop do I buy that in? Let me tell you, you know, Nothing was ever improved or redeemed by supplying it. It sounds like a kind of metaphysical plinth, you know, ontological basis. What is it? There is no such thing. Don't worry, you don't need one, right? Ground for ethics. We are always, just by being a human being, you are always already plunged into the ethical, right? You have inescapable insight into other people's vulnerabilities and cares and possibilities. And that is the basis of your ethical understanding and not something that lies outside you. Actually, I think the idea that ethics, the origin of ethics lies outside us is a form of nihilism. Because, I think, sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> because, I think that life and love and people are themselves intrinsically worthwhile. I don't think they need to have value pumped into them from some external source. And the idea that you don't have God in the picture, that somehow life and love and laughter and all that good stuff cease to be, cease to be valuable, that, that sounds to me like a, like a kind of nihilism. So I, I think the simplest and <coughs> most coherent position is just to acknowledge what we already know, that simply as human beings, we are worth the trouble. And that sounds like an end. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be 10 minutes of the remark time for each speaker. Sorry, I can't speak.
The doctor claimed that atheists don't have a world view. Well, actually, atheists do have a claim to knowledge. They say there is no God. Which, if you go to the Dictionary of Philosophy, it actually states that atheists have a particular worldview, or the beginnings of a worldview, because they have a knowledge claim. There is no God. I would agree with you with regards to reasonableness. It's a Quranic value. The Quran uses the word يَتَفَكَّرُونَ for those who reflect. If you study Arabic, you know this word actually means that the thing that you're reflecting upon, you must inquire about the implications of what you're meditating and reflecting upon. Deep thought. Also, I think the doctor was quite cheap in a way. A bit of a cheap shot in saying that I just use quotations. If you were attentive to my discussion, you'd have seen I gave you an argument and the quotations were like a little bit of spice or sauce to the meal. But they weren't the essence of the meal. The essence of the meal was an argument. The quotations just make me sound nice. <laughs> also, you talk about interpretation in holy books. I think that's, again, a fallacious argument. As if secular tradition or atheist tradition do not have any misinterpretations at all. Who studies law here? Good. Now, if you studied law, it's very basic. If you study statute law, UK secular statute law, you would know that there's four rules of interpretation. The mischief rule, the purposive rule, the golden rule, and the literal rule. <laughs> law 101. And we use these tools of interpretation to extract law. And we come to differences. So when there's human agency, you're going to have interpretation, you're going to have a scope of interpretation, and sometimes people go outside of that scope. It's a human phenomenon. Also, you talked about the cosmological argument, and you discussed that we don't know what it means for divine to create anything. This goes into the concept of what causality is. In actual fact, in philosophy, there is no one consensus on what causality is. So in absence of consensus, we go to the most basic definition, which is something that produces effect. This we can understand outside of experience and within experience. Because if you follow the Kantian thesis of causality, you will know that it's a priori. It's independent to experience. Because the way I could perceive things in this room is up to my own choice. I can see the first row or the last row. But if my son were to walk across this room, I have no choice but to see his front before I see his back. Now, in order for me to understand I could order my own perceptions, is based upon the innate concept of causality. Also, you try to refute the cosmological argument by talking about infinity. Well, your example was actually talking about the potential infinite. I was talking about the actual infinite. Because you took an event, said here is an event, but what caused the half of that event? And what caused that half? And so on. If you do that continuously, you can have a potential infinite. You will never reach an infinite. Also, the point I'm trying to make is, you still have an action event. So if you study what I'm trying to say, I'm talking about there is no such thing as an actual infinite into the real world. There's no ontological export. And then you conflated it by talking about mathematics again, which has its own axioms and conventions. But from a common sense, rational point of view, infinity doesn't make sense in the real world. Also, you talked about Hilbert and what made his greatness when he agreed with infinity or rejected infinity. To be honest, I think I'll leave that to God. Also, I think what you've done, you've brought some philosophical baggage to the discussion, I think... You're a skeptic, I don't want to say what you are, which is, but I, I'm assuming that. You know, there's no claim to truth, in essence, everything is skeptical. We may know, we may not know. I think that's a dangerous philosophy, in my opinion, because if we were skeptics from the onset, then we would never have this building, because we would, we would have to trust the basic laws of physics to build foundations and put the bricks on the wall, etc. So I think it's a dangerous position. It's also a self-defeating position because it claims there is no claim to truth. But does that mean there's truth in your claim? Also, you talked about, you talked about the Qur'an and you're saying 
you know, if it's your culture, if it defines who you are, of course you can agree with it. I think that's fallacious again. Maybe similar to the genetic fallacy. I was never brought up in a Muslim culture. I converted to Islam eight years ago, although I do look Pakistani. <laughs> it, it doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Kyaletiko. <laughs> So, I actually read the book and took it seriously because the Quran is a very existential text. It actually talks about your own reality and your position in life. Because the existentialists, the postmodern philosophers, they would say, Who are you? Are you just a result of your society? A reaction to social processes? This is what the Quran actually says. Makes you really think about yourself and your position. Who are you? What are you? If you don't know who you are, you don't know whose you are. This is why we don't know who we are, we don't know where we belong. Because the Quran actually says in a very deep way, Do they not reflect within themselves? Significantly, it says, are you just going to follow your forefathers, society? Is that who you really are? So the Quran is very profound. Also, the claim against the miraculous nature of the Quran with regards to linguistic history and science, that we could have lost the knowledge, is a logical fallacy. It's an argument from ignorance, which in Latin is called argumentum ad ignoration. You can't argue from ignorance. You even claim that we're basing things on reasonableness. If it's reasonableness, then let's, let's look at the evidence at hand. You may disagree with it, but let's outweigh the evidence. You can't start claiming, well maybe there was an alien. Or maybe we lost the knowledge and someone burnt it and we never knew why and how. This is an argument from ignorance. And you still haven't addressed any of those points. Then you talk about the native speak of Arabic. That you have to know Arabic to appreciate its linguistic miracle. No, you don't. All you have to appreciate is something about epistemology. The study of knowledge. Put your hand up. Who really believes that Greece exists? <laughs> Put your hand up who's been to Greece before. Not many of you. So you keep your hands down. <laughs> Have you ever spoken to a Greek person before? Yeah. In Greece. <laughs> In Greece. Have you broken Greek plates? In Greece. Lucky lady. <laughs> so the point is that the majority of you have never experienced Greece, but how do you claim the knowledge that Greece actually exists? You've never been there, never ate Greek food in Greece, never smashed plates in Greece. You've just seen it on a map that someone drew for you, but you believe it. Because it's something called testimony, recurrent reporting. And when we see non-Muslim and Muslim academics having a recurrent reporting to say the Quran is a linguistic miracle, then we could use the philosophy ourselves and derive that it's an event that lies outside the productive capacity of the Arabic language. We don't have to know any Arabic, it's just based on recurrent reporting, just like we know that Greece exists. So to reject the Quran will be equivalent of rejecting the existence of Greece. Also, you said, why did the Quran tell us to build ships and go to this civilization and that civilization? Well, there's an interesting quote, and the quote is, don't give people the ships, don't even give them the materials to build the ship, just give them desire to cross the ocean. And the Qur'an gives you the concept and the desire for the end goal. Not to say, here are the sub-components to build a ship. Because if you're a lazy fat bum, <laughs> sorry I was going to use a better word, but my French is quite limited. If, he, if you're lazy, for example, you won't build a ship. But if you give them the concepts, the ideas, the drive, the power, you will go over there, you'll find means and ways. And that's what the Qur'an does. Unfortunately, God doesn't give it to us on a plate because He realizes human beings can be self-driven by a simple idea. From an Islamic perspective, the simple idea is La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship but God, but Allah. And that is a seed that is planted in one soul that resonates so much that they, we actually did travel the earth. And where did we go? Europe. China. Spain. What happened in Spain? You had Jews. Heinrich Gratz, another Jewish historian, he said, the Jews lived favorably under the Mohammedans. So this is what the Quran did. Also, brothers and sisters, I probably have a minute left. 
talked about ethics. The only authority is yourself. Well, if authority is just yourself, then we could never say that killing six million Jews in Nazi Germany was a bad thing to do. Because there was a social consensus at that time to say it was a good thing. But if you have God as your conceptual anchor, it transcends human consensus and subjectivity. Because God is all-knowing or wise. We are accountable by God. And God transcends social pressures, and we have the moral motivation to not to do bad or good. Because if you think about it, if your end is just the grave, then it doesn't really matter. But if your end is accountability to the divine, then that gives you an awe-inspiring feeling to think, one, I'm not alone, and two, I am going to be accountable. And you're claiming about that you're not impressed by that morals need an ontological basis. Again, what about reasonableness? If you remove God out of the picture, then your ontological basis is either evolution or morality in terms of uh, or social pressure, in terms of the meaning and value for morals. So if we take social pressure, as we just mentioned, Nazi Germany, we have a problem. If we take, if we take evolution, then we also have a problem because evolution states that we're byproducts of a lengthy evolution process. Our morals have evolved just like it is or teeth. And if you read Darwin, what did Darwin say and imply? He said, if we were to evolve like the sharks, <coughs> then it would be okay to rape women. Because that's what they do. So you can't have your cake and eat it. Here. One minute we need to be reasonable, another minute just because we're just human beings. I would argue if we're going to have a constructive discussion about the Islamic foundations of the Islamic intellectual foundations and its world view. I think you really have to address every single one of my presuppositions and assumptions and statements about the historicity, scientific miracles, the linguistic aspects, the existence of God, in order for us to come to a positive conclusion. Because as a human being, I want to connect with everybody. The most insincere thing to do is to be insincere with oneself. So from a sincerity perspective, we need to be sincere with each other, and from that sincerity, we would want to connect with other human beings. Really removing our egos, because when it comes to truth or reasonableness, we really have to swallow our pride and our egos, and really express ourselves who we are, and really connect in ways that we haven't done before, because I think now the time is to do that, especially in Britain, 21st century. And hopefully in the Q&A we can have more of that discussion. Thank you very much. being invoked um, on the subject of causality, because Kant deals with causality in a book called The Critique of Pure Reason, and he sets up all the stuff about you have to have your uh, synthetic a priori knowledge in place, that's all in the first half of this book. What's he doing? He's developing the ground for the argument of the second half of The Critique of Pure Reason. I'm sure I don't need to remind you but one of the things he does in the second half is show that you can't have cosmological proofs of the existence of God. In fact, Kant's major part of Kant's effort is to show that um, so-called rational proofs of the existence of God can't work. So if you buy into Kant, if you helped yourself to Kant early on, then you're going to have to tell me at what point you get off Kant's train, otherwise you'll find yourself running in to Kant's arguments in the later part of his book about why the kind of argument that you've been making today can't work. Infinity in the real world. Well, as I explained, either space-time is continuous or it's quantized. I don't know, neither does anybody else. If it's continuous, then there is infinity in the real world, because to have infinity of, you know, to, to fill the space you need, any, however small your space is, for it to be a continuum, you'll need to have an infinity of points, right? And saying, oh, that's just mathematics, that's just notional, well, if space-time is continuous, then it's 
modeled in the real world. I don't really mind whether um, space-time is quantized or not. I do mind name-calling. I'm not a sceptic. Um, it's nice to hear philosophy 101, yes, saying that there can be no knowledge is itself a knowledge claim. Yes, and so, papam. You've got, you've got your sceptic on, on his own book, and, you know, that, was, that argument was there at the pre-Socratics, and that's why you won't find very many sceptics amongst professional philosophers. There are things that we can know reliably, like what, whether it's better to take the stairs or to step out of the 10th floor window, right? We've got fairly secure knowledge about that kind of stuff. And then there are things that we can't know, like how divinities, if there are such things, cause universes to come into existence. That's not something we can know about. And to say, oh, well, you know, there's some common sense um, definition that means one thing produces another. That's just tautology. That's just replacing one word where we don't really know what it means in this instance, cause, with another word where we don't really know what it means in this instance, right? Production. What does it mean for, what, you know, for a, a divinity to produce a physical universe? We don't know that either. We've just replaced one name for our ignorance for another. <laughs> the main point in there is I'm not a sceptic. Um, sometimes absence of evidence is evidence of absence. As I say, I don't pretend to be a deep scholar of the Quran, and I would not presume to... Uh, I do think that in order to read serious books carefully, you do have to read them in the original language. I mean, I've you know, made my own small efforts... Uh, in various philosophical texts. Forgive me, I haven't had time to master the Arabic language uh, to a sufficient level. I was invited to this debate, when was it? Sometime in December or was it November? November, right. I would have been doing well, I think, to have mastered the Arabic language to the point where I could uh, read the relevant passages of the Quran and not be a complete fool. Greece! Yeah, important difference between Greece and God, right? Testimony about Greece, first of all, is not confined to Greeks, right? Uh, and second, the main point, believing what people have to say about Greece doesn't require me to posit a whole new order of being, right? I don't have to shift my metaphysics in order to believe somebody's reports of Greece. Actually, I've... As it happens, I've been to Greece, but we can do Australia. I haven't been to Australia. <laughs> I don't need to posit a whole new order of being. I don't need to change my metaphysics in order to believe in Australia. I'm already familiar with land masses. Whereas, uh, you know, look, there are plenty of people who claim to have miraculous books, right? Uh, they can't all be right. And I haven't got time to investigate them all. Um, the fact that the fact that Jews were better off, better off under the Spanish Caliphate than they were under Ferdinand and Isabella, yeah, more or less everybody was better off under the Caliphate than they were because Ferdinand and Isabella were fascists. There's no argument about that. Um, but Islamic Spain was not an, was an equal society. If you weren't a Muslim in Islamic Spain, you had to pay higher taxes and you had fewer rights. Okay, accountability. Why? Why are you behaving decently, right? You feel tempted to some immoral act. You feel tempted to violence or theft, but you refrain. Why? Well, it may be because you think somebody's watching you. Or it may be because you understand that somebody will be damaged by your behaviour. I suggest to you but the second possibility is called ethics. The first possibility is called prudence. <coughs> if you want ethics, worrying about being accountable to somebody much bigger and more powerful than you is not it. Um, the suggestion was that if you take that out of the picture, 
all you've got to build your ethics on is evolution and social pressure. Well, no, I offered a third option, and that is the insight that comes from being a functional human being, right? We're not scientists, right? One of the ways in which this notion that if you take God out of the story, you're left with no ethics. One of the ways it works is <coughs> by, see, theism and scientism share perspective. It's the perspective from outside of human life, right? So if you take, take that perspective from outside of the lived human life, well, then you take God away, you can't see the ethics. Where's the ethics? No! That scientific, outside of human life perspective can't see ethics, it can't see money either. Nevertheless, money exists. Right? As far as physics is concerned, notes and coins in your pockets, if you have some, if you're that lucky, are only paper and metal, right? Physics, natural science can't detect money as such, although natural scientists can. Uh, nevertheless, money exists. Natural science can't tell the difference between the orchestra tuning up and the musical performance. Nevertheless, there's a difference. Nevertheless, there is music, and some music is better than others. These are facts. But they're only facts that are available from inside the practice of commerce, in the case of money, and in the case from inside the practice of um, music, from the case of music, right? So what I'm getting at is we're not just stuck with social pressure or with evolution, because clearly evolution just gives you, you know, whatever um, evolutionary pressures um, produce, and social pressure, as you say, sometimes pressure, social pressure can run in absolutely the wrong direction. We have inescapable insight into each other's needs and vulnerabilities and potentials. Right? And that's what goes wrong, that's what went wrong in, the, in, in Hitler's Germany, is in order to make this, this is why I think this is the, this is the sort of ethics. It's precisely because in order to make it possible for people to murder their fellow citizens by the millions, what did they do? They didn't take their religion away. No, 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 no. Religion stayed very much in place. What they had to do was dehumanize the victims, is block off that insight that we all have into each other's vulnerabilities and needs and potential. And that's one piece of evidence of a kind of you know, existen existential, experiential, philosophical sort for thinking that that kind of insight is really what the basis of ethics is. I think now it's time for some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Speakers, so we'll start off with Hamza. So, if there's any questions for Hamza, please raise your hands. Yeah, you start. Well, there's been a, some mention of Egypt and the subject of freedom in Egypt. And can I ask, should the Egyptian people have the freedom if they wish to convert to Christianity and Islam and worship uh, with freedom openly and not be persecuted? Um, that's a very interesting question. I uh, didn't talk about Egypt and freedom, but if you talk about freedom, we can do. Essentially, this goes to the point of the punishment of apostasy in Islam, just to be very frank. And the gentleman, what's your name? Richard. Richard was saying that would we allow as Muslims, or does the Islamic ethical framework allow Egyptians to convert to Christianity and worship, convert from Muslim Islam, I would, I, would, I would argue. There are varying jurisprudential opinions on this, there's about two. One of them is that converting from Islam without any reasons in terms of intellectual dialogue, then is capital punishment via due process and the process of law, something which can be equivalent to Treason, if we see at the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when you became an apostate, you joined the other side and fought the Muslims. The other opinion is that you can convert to another religion as long as you don't do so in the political, social sense. 
However, we must take into consideration that Islamic law is not something of a caricature. We have to understand that there are approximately 20 conditions of the apostate. If someone has a question, if someone has a question, then it must be answered. We don't want to kill people. That's not the point here. The point is, we want to implement what we believe to be divine law, and that has its own philosophical understanding, which we could discuss, which some of it we discussed. If God said it, therefore it's going to be true, because the philosophical principle is, what comes from truth is truth. However, we have to understand it's more nuanced than that. And the reason it puts such an emphasis is because we value truth. That's the point. Truth is very important. Whereas in a capitalist society, generally, the value is money. This is why we invade other nations to remove the so-called regime under the bar of a gun because of money. Because of capitalism. This is what happens. This is the reality of the 21st century. This is why the question is valid, but in priorities, we need to be pointing the finger at those who want to change a whole regime just because of money fundamentally and greed. So the point I'm trying to make is, yes, it's a valid question, but it's more nuanced. And I think it emphasizes that we put so much emphasis on truth. Truth from an Islamic philosophical perspective transcends blood relations, transcends tribal norms, transcends society. It's a human reality that is so important and metaphysical for us. So the point I'm trying to say is this. We don't want to kill people. We don't want to kill every single apostate. What we want to do is ensure that people come towards the truth. Rather than jump from one religion to the other for no good reason. That's why I said one of the conditions are, if they still have a question and it's not answered, then there's no punishment. Also, we need to take into consideration that in the Islamic ethical framework, we believe the most important thing, the Qur'an says, there is no compulsion in religion. So there's no forcing people adopting a certain worldview. Are you happy with that, Richard? Well, you may not be happy with the answer, but I, 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 are you, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? It sounds like compulsion to me. Okay. If it's a capital offense to leave Islam, then that's compulsion. Okay. Let, let, me, let me explain this. If, it, the, if the truth is so strong, yep. why do you have to punish people for not believing? Why can't you just convince people on its own? Okay, well, punishment for treason and punishment for not adopting a certain particular worldview happens all the time. For example, if you look at the, the conservative and liberal agenda for the Muslims, and if you analyze it carefully, there's going to be a social punishment for Muslims that have anti-liberal ideologies. I've been a victim of this. Smear campaign on ridiculous leftist extremist blogs claiming that we want to kill homosexuals and we hate them. Misquoting Islamic speakers. This is social punishment, social in exclusion, just because people seem to have different values and ideas. This is a shame. And it's a big shame. Get killed for it. This is a shame. Well, this is quite interesting because when you have social pressure, what does social pressure do? It creates the likes of EDL. And what would EDL may do eventually? Start having violence and havoc and killing people. Social pressure is even more dangerous than law sometimes. Because not everyone obeys law, but social pressure is such a powerful tool. Look what happened in Rwanda. Look what happened in Bosnia. Look what happened in Germany. So this is very powerful. Very powerful. At least our law is transparent. And we say, look, we don't want to kill you. We want you to have truth. But you can't leave based upon the fact, on your whims and desires, as if truth is a joke. And this, you, might, you may not take into consideration. Do you know why? Because your question presupposes an individualistic doctrine on human rights. A liberalist doctrine. We just, we're just not liberals. And that's the reality. Now, I'm assuming that the truth can persuade people by itself. Yeah, we believe that. That's why a lot of people in this country are converted to Islam in their droves. That's not the issue here. The issue is more of a social political one based on social pressures. If you study psychology, there's this social psychological thesis of social norms. And social norms are created by two processes. Informational social influence and normative social influence. And these influences are based upon social pressure, which actually changes 
your values and your behavior. If you study uh, Vivian Burr's work on social constructionism, you would see how powerful the change of social norms are. Just look at MTV 20 years ago. They weren't showing what they're showing today. I've been told, I don't watch MTV. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make, although your question is extremely valid, and I do appreciate it, it does require a further nuanced discussion. But it's not black and white, you die, you don't die. It's far more nuanced with regards to the value structure of Islamic ethics, and what's the nature of society. Do you presume an individualistic doctrine of man, self, and society? Or do we have a more of a communitarian approach? There's a whole different view. And I want you to just appreciate that it's not a caricature. Do you see my point? I just really want you to appreciate that. And it's very hard to, because if you have the media, that really paints Sharia law as a cartoon. For example, say the punishment of theft, which is cutting kind of the hand of the thief. They imagine a woman in a burqa with a sword down her jacket. <laughs> and a bearded man with a bit up to his navel, chasing the poor white kid who stole from Tesco's, because he was so hungry, he needed a cookie. And then he manages with his beard to trip him up. <laughs> and then the sister of the burqa pulls her swords out, Allah Akbar! <laughs> but this is the caricature of a comprehensive legal framework for 1400 years that's been developed, that has been created by the likes of Fox News, Sky News and BBC, which in my opinion, is media vomit. It's media vomit. And if a true human being, this is why I was frank with you, I'm not going to lie to you and say, well, Islam is all about peace. It's not. Islam is about submission to God, and as a result, you get peace. So the point I'm trying to say to you is that I want to connect with you as a human being and be frank, but in that frankness, it does also require a huge discussion about what we mean by society, what we mean about truth, what we mean about social norms, what we mean about individualism or communitarianism, what we mean by law itself. It goes on and on and on. So the point is... You need to take my email address or my number, <laughs> and we can have a couple of pints of milk. Questions <laughs> <laughs> for Do I offer to say anything about that? Uh, I just want to comment on, on your speech. You just mentioned that. Um, uh, God's way of communication that's referring to one man at a certain point in a certain point in history is being in, uh, inefficient. But 1400 years later, we are debating about Islam and atheism. I think it's been a very efficient way of uh, communicating with people. So, what do you think about it? Well, I can't help, you know, another way to put that is it's taken 1400 years, right? And there's still, you know, there's, there's still another three continents to go. This, it just strikes me that... I, I, it's not a strong argument, that's what I mean. Well... <laughs> oh, oh, just um, the point was that I was, I was suggesting that the divine communication strategy was fragile because... Um, it consists of giving the message once to one person and then relying on a rather slow transition process of, of people sort of spreading out. Um, handing out leaflets as they went, I believe, uh, was the, the process as the Islamic army surged out of um, the Arabian Peninsula. I think it was just a leaflet's job. That's maybe. But the serious point is, you know, your, your question is, well... Um, wouldn't it have been... What about if it matters that people should hear this word? If, if your life is impossible to understand without it? Think about the Aborigines, right? There they are. How many generations have born and died over those 1,400 years without the benefit of the Islamic message? Now, if the Islamic message is vital for us all, <laughs> Why didn't those four, 1,400 years worth those, of people... Those, those cases will be dealt with differently on the Day of Judgment. You know, this is a different question. You said it's, inif uh, it's an insufficient or inefficient well, but, but look, way of, ah, ah, of ah, communicating. But, ah, but if those, ways are, if, those ways, if those cases, if the people who haven't heard the word 
are dealt with adequately, right? If it's okay for somebody never to hear the word yeah. because they will be dealt with in a different way in the day of judgment, why why give, put out the word at all? Yeah? If it's if it's if it's perfectly adequate, if there's no loss, if there's no diminution in those human lives because they didn't hear the word, then suddenly the word doesn't seem very important at all, does it? It is important. We oh, but if it, 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 if it is important, then, then it. he should have been telling the Aborigines. And the people living yeah. in North and South America. Yeah, but nothing to say that they haven't been told. Oh, we can let you ask a different question for a second. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Are there any sisters who have questions for Hamza? No sisters. Okay, I just wonder. Okay. How would you describe God? How would I describe God? It's a very interesting question. It's a logical question. The way I would describe God is the way the Quran describes God. Because what we say is this. From a rational perspective, we can come to the conclusion there's a cause for the universe. Upon conceptual analysis, we can agree, which I discussed in my presentation, that this cause is one, therefore unique, eternal, uncaused, immaterial, and has a will. Therefore, it can have a relationship with the universe. So these are the basic definitions of a monotheistic God. The rest of the descriptions, I don't know. What happens is, it's like a knocking on the door. We don't know who's behind the door. We have to say, hello, who is it? It's me, Abdullah. So there has to be an external revelation. Because if we internalize the conception of God, we'll have six billion different views of who God is. This is what we've been arguing since 6,000 BC Sumeria on who God is. God knows. <laughs> so the point is, it has to be external. So I suspend my judgment. But when a revelation came to me, I came from a humanist family. He comes from the, doctor comes from the humanist tradition as well. I came from a humanist family. My dad is a new age spiritual humanist. Yeah? He carries most of the realities of the humanist doctrine. If you want to use that word, yeah? But lightly, yeah? Small d. <laughs> so, so the, if he's a new ager, he's nowhere near my part of town, let me tell you. Well, he doesn't have an earring, but... <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, exactly, we're miles apart. <laughs> I didn't say that in a bad way, I'm trying to say that, you know, my dad's probably less new age than you, that was my point. Oh, okay. uh, so, so what happens is we need revelation. So, what are the criteria for revelation, which I didn't discuss in my presentation, and the criteria are, one, it has to have a logical, consistent view on who God is. It can't say now God is an elephant and has seven arms. It's part of the material world. Because how can the part of the material world create the material world? It's a paradox, inconsistency. Secondly, it must be internally and externally consistent. And thirdly, it must have a signpost to the transcendent. Like miracles, like what I discussed, the scientific, historical, and linguistic miracles. Once you accept that's the text from the divine, then when the divine talks about itself, you accept it, because he's talking about himself. For instance, the beard description is in the Quran, and I say in the Arabic, because in the Islamic spiritual tradition, we believe the Arabic is also a healing for everybody. Yeah? So because the Prophet told us, لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبُّ لَهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ You're not a true believer unless you love for others, what you love for yourself. I like healing for myself, I want it for you too. Yeah? So God says in the Quran, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدِ اللَّهُ السَّمَدِ لَمْ يَلِيدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوَ وَنَهَدِ Say, say, talking to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, God is one, the unique, the eternal, the self-subsisting, he begets not, nor was he begotten. And there is nothing like unto him. This is the basic definition on who God is from the Islamic tradition. But it also includes God is the most merciful, He is the loving. Al Wudud. Al Wudud in Arabic means not just loving, but an excessive form of love. This is what the Prophet told us in the prophetic traditions. He said, You see this woman and her child, would you want that woman? Do you think that woman would throw her child into the fire? No way. And the Prophet told us, God loves us more than that. So that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you really want to know who God is, let's talk to the Muslims as well after this presentation. Thank you.
um, that I could recommend to you. But anyway, um, your thought is that knowledge evolves, right? That we learn more. Yeah. Um, that's right. And we learn more about how religions develop. And we learn more about how holy books get written. Right? And we learn more about how religious traditions uh, evolve. Yeah? And so, one of my reasons for not being religious is that we're in possession of an understanding of how religions develop that doesn't require us to participate. All right, that's gone some way from the original question. Yeah. But the answer is, uh, Darwin explains almost nothing of the things that we do. That's not a problem, because it's only supposed to explain the structure of our bodies. Okay, we're running out of time, so we're going to leave it there for the question session. And we're going to close the speech, so Hamza, uh, you can take four minutes, please. Sure. Thank you. To be honest, I don't think I have anything more substantial to add, apart from I'd like to think the doctor for being a positive participant, anything that may have come across offensive, huge apologies. It's not the Islamic character of me, it's rather the Greek character in me. <laughs> so that, huge apologies. But I'd like to express myself and really connect with other human beings. I think that's very important. One of the things that the doctor said is that in ethics, when we have problems because we dehumanize people, <coughs> But dehumanization comes from an idea and a concept. And the logical conclusions from the atheistic concept, or the atheistic worldview, if you like, is that we are just molecules. That is the logical conclusion from atheism, from varying perspectives. Someone may then say, well, intrinsically, I'm a human being, I know what that means to be, therefore I'm going to be compassionate. But you can go the other way around. And you, can't, you can develop materialistic doctrines like communism that killed millions and millions of people. We had six million Christians that died. There's no memorial day for those six million Christians. What about the 60 million people that died under Chairman Mao? Under materialistic doctrines. But yes, I agree. Atheism doesn't just promote materialism. And people could have seen it in a different way. However... I believe dehumanization from a historical perspective, see the whole corpus of material history has been attributed to this very basic concept that we're just matter. And if we're just matter, then it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I don't think the doctor provided any undercutting philosophical defeaters. What does this mean? This means he didn't bring any counter arguments that really broke down my argument. And he didn't even bring a case for atheism. He was always on the defense. <laughs> yeah, as the boxes do. But, but he didn't he didn't come with an attack on what atheism is and how it has stronger philosophical foundations. The belief in no God. Or even coming from a humanist tradition, how is that more reasonable? None of this came into the conversation. None of this. So, hopefully, after this presentation, we could have maybe a discussion over drinks, non-alcoholic, of course, <laughs> and have a really positive discussion about Islam, atheism, and everything else in between. On a final note, I would like to add that it's very important for all of us as human beings to really understand that we need to question just like the famous Islamic poet, when he said, whose voice is the voice amongst the million of voices in my mind? We need to really pick out what does it mean to be a human being? We don't even question this sometimes. We are always a reaction to context. But we must allow context to react to who we really are. And I truly believe, if we remove the ego as best as we can, we really allow our nature to shine out, which is in line with the Islamic doctrine of fitra. Fitra means the innate disposition. And we believe everyone has been created with the innate disposition of understanding basic morality and ethics and the conception of the oneness of God. And I think when we do that, remove our ego, not become a reaction to context, but allow context to react to us, 
then hopefully we'll have a better place on this planet. I wish it for you. I wish it for me. I wish it for my son. Thank you very much. childhood playing rugby league, so, you know, bruising encounters are something that I've always done as um, a kind of refreshing uh, pastime, so that's fine. Um, as long as there's kind of whistle-to-whistle -whistle understanding, right, when the whistle goes. Um, some selective deafness there, I think. I did make a positive case. positive case is, first of all, that... Um, the best explanation for the existence of religion is not itself religious, right? I pointed out that you all have explanations for the existence, for the historical emergence, for the development of religions that you don't subscribe to. These, I think, are persuasive. And all you have to do to make your position more coherent, easier to carry around in your head, right? Less metaphysically uh, extreme, is to extend whatever it is you've been saying about all the religions you don't subscribe to, to the one that you do. Right? And then you will have a simpler, more coherent world. And, I did make a positive case, which is this. That uh, I have a better account of ethics. Right? Saying that yeah, there is there is something outside of human life that pumps value into it, doesn't really give you ethics. Right? Because what it says is that human life isn't really worthwhile until something else arrives. Right? In the absence of that something else, where you know, then we really are just molecules. By the way, I thought I spent some time explaining that we're not just molecules. Right? We also have uh, everything else that we've learned to do. So I was a little surprised by the selective deafness, um, but nevertheless, that, that is often the way with these things. And I'll end by uh, thanking you again for your hospitality, and um, I wish you well in the rest of your design for management.